Welcome to lecture number 33. Today we are talking about the market revolution and industrialization in the early 19th century. Our theme for today is work, exchange, and technology. Our learning objective is explain the cause and effects of innovations in technology, agriculture, and commerce over time. Let's begin with the first key concept on the foundation for the market revolution. Entrepreneurs helped to create a market revolution in production and commerce, in which market relationships between producers and consumers came to prevail as the manufacturer of goods became more organized. Some foundation that was necessary for a market revolution to take place has ties to the U.S. Constitution and the enforcement of contracts. In Article I of the Constitution, the states are denied the power to make any law that impairs the obligation of contracts. That means that a contract must be upheld and one may not be released from its obligations through a piece of legislation. So, states or any other private party cannot get in the way of a private contract. This is upheld in the court case decision of Dartmouth College v. Woodward in 1919, decided by Chief Justice John Marshall. This clause in the Constitution allows actors in the economy to have the confidence to make large business transactions, without the fear that a buyer may get off from having to pay, or that a producer could be released from their responsibility of delivering the goods that have been purchased. The Constitution also includes a clause that protects intellectual property through the protection of patents. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8 guarantees that anyone who had filed a patent with the United States for a proprietary invention can be the sole beneficiary of any profit made from the invention unless properly licensed by the patent holder. Patents, in order to be granted, have to be submitted with schematics and explanations of how the invention works and how it is unique to other existing inventions. The patent shown on the screen is that of the cotton gin patented by Eli Whitney in 1794. Finally, the development of corporations provides a less risky method of entering into business. A corporation is a company that has the ability to sell stake in the exchange for capital. The people within the corporation can use the capital raised to expand business operations and gain more profit. The stockholders, in turn, can get a share of the profits of the corporation without ever being liable for the debts of the company if it ever becomes bankrupt. States like New York expanded the ability of corporations to sell stock. This opens up big opportunities for companies to raise capital and invest in large enterprises like factories or other machinery. By reducing the amount of risk and increasing the opportunities for profit, corporations, where they were promoted, incentivized more companies to form and thus grow the economy. The next key concept is about some of the major inventions from this period. It says, innovations including textile machinery, steam engines, interchangeable parts, the telegraph, and agricultural inventions increased efficiency of production methods. Textile machinery was brought over from England by Samuel Slater. He brought over all the trade secrets from the textile industry in Britain, when at the time, England was trying to keep factory and machine parts a secret from the rest of the world in order to keep their comparative advantage. Lowell, Massachusetts became the model for a factory town in the United States. Mills and factories spring up alongside its naturally occurring streams that provide a form of hydroelectric power. Factories in Lowell were based on the textile industry and hired women as a source of cheap labor. The only women who were being hired were young, unmarried, single women, usually from rural areas. Once women factory workers would find a husband or a mate, they could no longer continue to work at the mill. That was partly because all of the workers lived on site and had strict moral codes they had to follow in order to keep their job. Steam engines helped the economy and the market revolution in two ways. The first is that factories no longer have to be located near streams or rivers to use hydroelectric power. The second is that it turns rivers into two-lane highways. With the power of the steam engine, Robert Fulton develops a steamboat that could travel upriver. It was a very slow pace, around 5 miles an hour, but it was revolutionary because now all of the products that were normally only going downstream could also go upstream to new markets. The concept of interchangeable parts was utilized and proven to be profitable with guns by Eli Whitney during the War of 1812. He developed this into a larger business. The painting on the slide depicts his gun factory in 1827. The process includes creating standardized parts that make up a larger machine or product and putting them together at the end once all the parts are made, opposed to making one product at a time with the possibility of having variation between the parts that make up the whole. Using interchangeable parts increased efficiency, lowered costs, and made it easier to repair or replace machines. The telegraph was developed by Samuel Morse in 1844. 
Not only does he patent his invention, but also Morse code. That was the language used to communicate messages through the connected telegraphs. Telegraph wire could be installed across large distances and eventually make communication possible between the different regions of the United States. Even later on, there will be a telegraph cable that's installed across the Atlantic and links two continents together. But for the most part, the telegraph lines are being placed alongside roads and later railroad tracks. The steel plow was one new agricultural invention. A small image of the patent is shown on the right side of the slide. The steel plow, along with the mechanical reaper, allowed farmers to plant across a larger field with less manpower. The steel plow was lighter and moved faster through the soil and eventually could be pulled by a tractor. Inventions such as these led to the growth of commercial farming. Commercial farms planted more crops, had higher yields, and drove the price of food crops down. Farmers with smaller plots are less able to compete and are forced to sell their land to the growing commercial farms. This, coupled with cheap land out west, increased the amount of commercial farms in the United States that export their food to the growing urban areas in the East Coast. The next key concept deals with the forms of transportation that were used to get these goods to market, and it's split up into two parts. The first says, legislation and judicial systems supported the development of roads, canals, and railroads, which extended and enlarged markets and helped foster regional interdependence. The National Road, also called the Cumberland Road, linked Maryland to Illinois. It was unique to others from the time period in that most other roads were private and this one was public. The others were called turnpikes or toll roads, and at the time it was not an accepted role for the federal government to pay for roads across different states. Democratic Republicans, who dominated national politics in the early 19th century, thought that it should fall upon the states to fund their own internal improvements or transportation projects. A good example of this is the Erie Canal, which passed Congress, but it was vetoed by James Madison because it lay solely within one state. So it fell upon the state of New York to construct it, and with its completion in 1825, it connected the Hudson River to the Great Lakes. Consumers were now able to buy goods from each region and transport goods back and forth. Railroads became competitive with other modes of transportation by the 1830s. This, along with steamboats at the early beginning stages, were rather dangerous. If too much pressure built up inside the steam engine, it could actually explode and kill the people on board. However, by the 1830s, the steam engine is perfected and standardized, making it safer. The interdependence that is created between the urban northeast and the rural south is due to their differing economic activity. The North is no longer planting its own food crops and are relying on the Midwest to plant that food through commercial farming enterprises and ship it back to the East Coast. Cotton was grown in southern plantations and shipped north to be refined in northern factories. Ultimately, it's woven into cloth and textiles that are sold throughout the country. The second part of this key concept on transportation says transportation networks link the North and Midwest more closely than they link the regions in the South. The two maps on the screen show all of the highways and roads in the United States in 1825 and all of the canals in the United States at the same time. They show a lot more connections through roads and canals in the Northeast and in the West than in the South. The clearest difference is in the map of canals, as the majority of canals in the U.S. are located and constructed in the Northeast. This has the effect of the North becoming more reliant on the food crops from the Midwest. It's also the reason why they continue to invest more heavily on those transportation routes. The North also has more capital to invest in new transportation because they're making a lot of money from factories. The South, in turn, did not develop as many man-made transportation routes because of its abundance of navigable rivers that led to ports along the Atlantic and the Gulf. This meant that their crop output, mostly cotton, could still reach a port for export, but it was not linked to other regions or even other states nearby in the way that the North and the West were. These two transportation maps become more relevant later in the Civil War because the North's ability to move troops to southern lines was really advantageous, while the South's inability to keep up with that kind of movement plays a role in their defeat. The last key concept says increasing southern cotton production and the related growth of northern manufacturing, banking, and shipping industries promoted the development of national and international commercial ties. The North and the South were interconnected due to cotton. Cotton was grown in the South using enslaved labor and was refined in northern factories. The textile that was produced and sold in the North were dependent on that slavery that extracted the cotton from plantations. As plantations expanded, they increased the use of enslaved labor. The price of an enslaved person varied on characteristics like age, gender, physical ability, and history of defiance. Despite that, the price of an enslaved person was often high enough that financing through a bank loan was required. 
This in turn made banks and insurance companies involved in the purchase of Southern land and the purchase of enslaved people, all complicit in the institution. Most of the banks and large financial institutions in the country at this time were located in the North and benefited from the sale of human beings. Shipping companies based in the North also benefited from the institution of slavery. The profits they made from the increasing in transportation of goods made of cotton were all tied to slavery. The moral stance of northern states may have differed, but cotton was so closely tied to economic growth in the early 19th century that everyone in the country benefited from it. Slavery was an institution that touched every part of the economy, and every region in the country was closely interconnected because of it. Finally, for the recap, entrepreneurship was protected by the Constitution and upheld by the Supreme Court leading to this new market revolution and the creation of a market economy. New inventions made production faster and cheaper, and there were developments in transportation that increased economic activity. The country's different regions, the North, South, and the West, were becoming more interdependent. And finally, that interdependence makes some regions, which had already abolished slavery, complicit in its continuation in the South. Thank you for watching. If you would like to watch the next lecture, you can click on the video link on the screen. And if you're looking for more practice to help you on the AP exam, you can visit apushlights.com. I wish you the very best in all of your studying and look forward to seeing you back on the next lecture.